All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Mackenzie. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm so excited to be here with you guys today. I know that it's a Friday at 7 p.m., so I'm so thankful that you guys were here to join me. Um, today, I kind of just wanted to take you through my journey as a neurogastroenterology motility PA, and it's kind of a unique specialty, so hopefully you're going to learn something today and um, I can take you through how I became a PA and a doctorate level PA um, and everything that kind of encompasses that. Um, and so I had to, of course, if anybody has seen my Instagram, you know that I absolutely adore my golden doodle puppy. Um, Actually, he's two. He's not really a puppy anymore, but I still call him a puppy. Uh, his name's Louie. He has an Instagram as well, Louie Doodles. He is my pride and joy. So um, I had to share some pictures of him today. Um, so a little bit about myself. I um, actually am. Oh, yeah. Sorry, really quickly. Your screen. Um, I don't know if it's just on my end, but I can't see it. Oh, no. OK, let me see. Just before you got too far in. <laughs> oh, no, thank you. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out how to switch it over. Can everybody see her screen? Am I the only one that can't see her screen sharing? Hmm. Let me see. Do you know how I could? Oh, maybe I can try this again. I was going to say, I think if you just hit the. What about now? Yes, there it goes. No. Okay. Yep, it's up. Here's my golden doodle. <laughs> so if <laughs> okay. wants to see him. Um, yeah. So I'm McKenzie again. Um, so a little bit about myself before we get started. So I'm actually from Lexington, North Carolina. It's a really small town in North Carolina. It's actually barbecue capital. Um, and so. I love sharing that because if anybody knows of Lexington, you've heard of the barbecue there before. Um, and so I'm going to tell you about my PA experience. So this is my Instagram page. It's kind of funny how I decided to do this. So the American Neurogastroenterology Motility Society, they actually asked me to create this page. Um, I was the youngest one in the society for motility physicians. Um, and they said, hey, can you create this page and then get other young people excited about motility? Because it's such a unique field that I feel like a lot of people haven't really heard about it, um, and especially students. So it's a great, you know, way to learn about motility. And so I just wanted to start off with my story. Um, I think, and I tell every student this that comes with me, that if you are passionate about what you end up doing, then you're going to love your job every single day. Um, I go to work every day and I'm just obsessed with it. I love it so much and I have so much fun. And so if you have something passionate um, and like a personal experience that you go through, then I think that really makes all the difference. Um, so I included pictures on either side. That's my sister, um, Cameron. And so whenever I was 12 years old, my sister was diagnosed with Guillain-Barre syndrome which for those of you who are not familiar with Guillain-Barre, it is sometimes a fatal disease. It's an autoimmune disease that attacks your nervous system and specifically the myelin sheet. So the part that covers the nerves um, in your central nervous system and your peripheral nerves. And so it attacks those nerves by your autoimmune system overproduction. Um, and so she was actually six months pregnant at the time with my nephew, Cooper, who's in the middle. Um, and she had a flu vaccine. And so you may see like on flu vaccines, it says there's a risk of Guillain-Barre syndrome. There is a risk. My sister developed Guillain-Barre and she was hospitalized in the intensive care unit for months. And she was completely paralyzed from the neck down. Um, she couldn't talk. She couldn't breathe. She was on a ventilator. And it was a traumatizing time in our family's lives. And my mom basically lived at the hospital for that time whenever I was 12. And so that was really difficult. Um, 
And the reason why I chose to be a PA was because the people who were saving my sister's life were the PAs. So the PAs would come into my sister's room and they would talk to me. And I was so invested in everything that was happening with her that they just took the time and explained everything that was happening. She ended up living, um, you can see based off of these pictures, and my nephew, who's extremely healthy now. Um, and so it's kind of a success story. She is doing so much better. She still has some deficits, but this is really why I chose to be um, a PA was because I wanted to be like the people who saved my sister's life. And so after that time, whenever my sister kind of recovered, I got so invested and obsessed with the medical care field, healthcare field. And I wanted to know everything that I possibly could. And this was like middle school, like just beginning high school, whenever um, I was going through this transition. And I wanted to shadow every single person that I possibly could. So I went to my primary care, who was also a PA. And I said, who do you know? Who do you refer to? And I just got all of those names and went face to face and wrote letters and said, can I shadow you? So I did, I went to the cancer center and this was at Wake Forest University um, and hospital. I shadowed in digestive health and watched colonoscopies, endoscopies. I first assisted even in high school, um, with tonsillectomies, with ENT, I did pediatric rotations, wound care, where I learned how to use hyperbaric chambers and skin grafts, which was awesome. Um, I helped with hiatal hernia repairs, gallbladder surgeries, and general surgery. I even shadowed in physical therapy because I thought maybe that would um, help me. Nursing home, um, cardiology, I had a very interesting shadowing experience. So the cardiologist that I shadowed was actually my grandfather's cardiologist. And um, she was amazing. And she said, I'm going to go in the next room. Your grandfather is having a stress test. How about you do the stress test for me? Then tell me the result. At that time, I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know how to read an EKG or anything of the sorts. And so my grandfather is on this treadmill and he's doing the stress test. And then all of a sudden the alarms go off, his heart monitor goes off, the EKG system is beeping. And little did I know my grandfather was having a heart attack and he completely had a sinkable episode, passed out on the treadmill and I'm screaming for the cardiologist. And he had to be rushed um, to surgery and had a quadruple bypass at that time. So. That was a traumatizing shadowing experience, <laughs> but it taught me a lot at that time. Um, I also did autopsies, which was amazing. Um, I wrote about this in one of my um, posts on Instagram and the autopsies taught me so much that the medical examiner would leave me there with the patient and he would say, now you tell me what is wrong and how did this patient die? And I would have to go through everything, see where the broken bones were, were they in a car accident, talk about where they had a bleed. And then whenever I got to PA school and the cadaver lab, I had already seen it. And so I wasn't shocked and I already knew so much anatomy because I had that experience. At that time um, in high school, I then decided to get my um, CNA license and I worked any possible shift that I could. So I would be ready whenever I wanted to apply to PA school. I worked in a psychiatric hospital, which was, I have great stories for that, um, getting punched in the face, getting chased down the hallway um, by patients and just having so many great experiences. And this really helped me in my current career in the psych neurogastroenterology field where patients do have brain gut disorder um, axis issues and diseases. So um, it really did help. I also was a CNA in the medical surgical unit, the emergency department, the ICU and labor and delivery. And then I went to High Point University. Um, if anybody is from North Carolina, which I don't think anybody on the chat said that they were, but this is known as 
the country club of schools in North Carolina. It was fantastic. I met my husband there. It was great. Um, my organic chemistry class only had two people, me and one other person. So this was so great um, and really led me to PA school at that time. I did some unique things in college. I knew that I really wanted to be in research. I wanted to be a PI. I wanted to get grants. And this is abnormal for PAs, not that it hasn't ever been done, but it most PAs are strictly clinical. And I wanted to do both. Um, so I actually went to Wake Forest and had in and out jobs at Wake. And I was on a monkey farm. I worked on a monkey farm at a time and learned from PhDs about cervical cancer research. And then I did um, estrogen cell breast cancer lines and looked at how soy products in our environment affected those breast cancer cells. And so I did all of this at High Point University. Um, and that was really rewarding, all of that research. And it taught me so much. I then applied to PA school. I applied to about 12 schools in North Carolina, which doesn't seem a lot compared to a lot of people that I've talked to. But um, and then I kind of the last minute I found this program called University of it was at University of Lynchburg. Um, it was a master's in PA medicine. And they were the very first doctorate program for PAs. And I thought to myself, if I'm going to go into research and I want a leadership role as a PA, this would be a fantastic opportunity. So I applied to the master's program and along with that came the doctorate program and I was accepted. Um, I had two weeks in between undergraduate degree and starting PA school which was a little crazy because I had to move states. I had always lived in North Carolina. And so I was moving to Virginia, a whole new state. So that was um, interesting. And then this is me in PA school. It was a fantastic opportunity. I met so many people, um, so many great friends, and they all had a joke um, for me in PA school that it was hashtag raising McKinsey because I went straight from high school into this country club college where they did my laundry for me and provided all of the food for me, did everything. And then when I moved by myself, I had no idea what I was doing. So all of these people helped me so much. This is a mission trip that we did in PA school um, to the Dominican Republic, and it was so rewarding. Um, a lot of PA programs tend to do this, um, along with fellowship programs, tend to go on mission trips. And if you look over to the right side, we were in um, surgery, actually. So three of us out of our PA class got chosen to first assist in surgical procedures in the largest hospital in Dominican Republic. And I first assisted on a hysterectomy, so removal of the uterus. It was so crazy. So the surgeon actually handed me the uterus and he told me to put it in the jar. And I was like, that's strange. So I turned around and the nurse is standing there with basically a milk jug. Like they cut the top of a milk jug, a plastic one off. And I had to put the uterus in this milk jug and it had flies and mosquitoes and everything around it. And I thought to myself, wow, we are so lucky here in the United States. And that was just one story. We did surgery on pool floats in the back. We had emergency pulmonary embolisms and all kinds of things that we learned. And basically on this mission trip, we had to act like PAs. There were not enough, um, you know, attending there to help us. So it was us on our own and it taught us so much. So if you have that opportunity, I would definitely do that. And then my PA school clinical rotation. So general surgery, behavioral medicine, dermatology, nephrology, emergency medicine, primary care, pediatrics, cardiology. These are all standard for PA school. And then we all ran a free clinic um, where we were basically the PA taking care of um, the patient, and then we would have PAs there or attendings that would help us. And then this is very unique, but I did all my electives in PA school in gastroenterology because I knew that's what I wanted to do. But I, 
I knew I wanted to do something in rheumatology, neurology. I loved, I always told everybody I wanted to be the house of PAs. I wanted to have really difficult diagnostic, you know, test diagnostic um, testing that I could really figure out what was wrong with a patient. And so that's whenever I met um, Dr. Sigmund. He's a gastroenterology who kind of pushed me towards my career in GI motility. Um, I did all of my electives with this group in Charlotte, North Carolina at Atrium Health, where I currently work now. And he taught me all the general gastroenterology that I know. Um, and then I met my mentor. So Dr. Baha Moshri, she is the director of gastroenterology motility at Atrium Health. She actually wrote the guidelines for irritable bowel syndrome. She's very well known around the world. She speaks in like Korea and Germany and all these different places. Um, and she basically met me six months into my PA school training. And I told her about my sister's story and how I had this passion to become a PA leader. And I really wanted an independent practice. I didn't want to have a supervising physician. That was never my intention. I always wanted a collaboration between a physician and myself. And she was 100% for that. She wanted to teach me everything. So she told me she wanted me to be her second brain. And that's what it is now. Um, so at that time, and this is after, you know, graduation, this is us in our white coat. And then I went into the Doctorate of Medical Science program. So I just added a little bit about what this is. Um, so it's a doctorate degree that was developed by PAs for PAs, which is awesome. It's kind of supposed to be under the same lines as the nurse practitioner doctorate, um, but for PAs. So it advances your clinical practice and you can kind of pick a specialized area that you want to be in and then try and be the best that you can and work at the highest level of your license as a PA. And it helps to bring leadership roles towards PAs. And so at the same time that I did the doctorate program, right after graduating from my master's program and getting my um, certified PA license and medical license, I then did a fellowship program in gastroenterology motility at the same time. Very crazy. Not sure if I would recommend it, but it, I'm glad that I did it um, completely. So um, in the doctorate program, you learn about evidence-based medicine, organizational behavior and leadership, administration. You do healthcare law, which is extremely important for malpractice and negligence and all of these things that you need to know um, with your medical degree. And we also do a big practicum. So like a thesis project, you do a thesis in your PA school, but you also do a thesis in this doctorate program. And mine was on irritable bowel syndrome biomarkers, which is a really hot topic right now in gastroenterology. And then you learn about disaster medicine and global health issues, which is so important, especially right now. And then the fellowship program that I did at the same time, it was interesting. So Atrium Health has a fellowship program for PAs and nurse practitioners. But of course, I didn't have a gastroenterology motility um, fellowship program. So my mentor, Dr. Moshri, and I created this fellowship program. Um, and I was the one and only, but it was amazing. And so it was a year long program where I learned how to interpret and read motility studies, including esophageal manometries. Um, this is pre-surgery or to tell how people are swallowing. So how the nerves and the muscles are working to help contractions of the esophagus. Uh, pH testing, so acid reflux studies. Anal rectal manometries are for patients who have like chronic constipation or fecal incontinence. And we look and see how the muscles are working in the rectum. Um, I do the breath test studies and like for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or lactose intolerance, sucrose intolerance, those types of things. I also did general gastroenterology at that time. Inpatient gastroenterology, I first assisted in very complex esophageal surgeries, um, like poems, which are perioral esophageal myotomies. 
um, Nissen fundoplications, which are anti-reflux surgeries, complex hernia repairs. I first assisted in colorectal surgery, um, was in the inflammatory bowel disease clinic, and we run a cystic fibrosis GI motility clinic as well. And then I did rotations in pelvic floor physical therapy and urogynecology. And then this is my graduation from the doctorate program and my mentor with me. And then this is the fellowship graduation. And this is at my office um, at Digestive Health and CMC Surgery. And this is now. Um, so up in the left-hand corner, So you can see I have patients come and see us in my neurogastroenterology clinic. They have seen four, six, ten different gastroenterologists. Um, they've been scoped many times. They may have had really complex surgery histories. They may have um, multiple neurological disorders. We see Parkinson's patients, MS patients, lupus. Um, I saw a patient today with dermatomyositis. Just the whole realm um, of patients that are very complex. And so I, it's my job to go through all of those records before I see a patient. And then this is just us hanging out at the office. My mentor is Persian, so she tries to get me to eat cow tongues and all kinds of things that are not from North Carolina. So she always jokes with me about that. And then this is us wearing our squatty potty crowns because we are always talking about the squatty potty. This is recent. Um, so we gave COVID vaccines at the Carolina Panther Stadium, which was so rewarding and so awesome. I would highly recommend if you get the opportunity to volunteer for this. And so what do I do? every day and it changes by the day to be honest um but the neurogastroenterology motility pa role um, i have many different roles and like i said it just keeps changing i mostly evaluate and treat motility disorders including esophageal disorder so say a patient has parkinson's disease and they may have difficulty initiating their swallows or if a patient has lupus this can also affect the, the esophagus and cause weakness. I also see patients with esophageal spasms, just any motility disorder. Um, I treat gastroparesis, which is slow gastric emptying, which causes severe nausea, abdominal pain, vomiting, weight loss. I see a lot of patients with GJ tubes or feeding tubes, um, gastrogenostomy tubes. I treat small intestinal bacterial overgrowth which is a common topic right now. And my specific passion is neurogenic bowel. So I'm the director of the neurogenic bowel program at Atrium Health, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. I also see patients who go through complex esophageal and um, stomach surgery, so really complex hernia surgeries. I treat chronic constipation, and whenever I say chronic, I'm talking patients who do not have a bowel movement for eight, 10 months, um, really severe. And then pelvic floor disorders, like women who have had childbirth and they are having fecal leakage and things like that. So some women's health as well. And then I recommend and implement treatments and care plans. A lot of our medications can be through investigational drug trials with the FDA. Um, so they're not common drugs that other gastroenterologists prescribe and they have a lot of side effects um, and complex disorders that you have to really think about. Um, so whenever they get to us, it's usually a very severe patient. I also order diagnostic tests, prescribe medications. Um, I help with the pelvic floor physical therapy treatments, collaborate with our surgeons, and then I facilitate clinical research protocols and discuss clinical trials with patients as well. And then, of course, interpret motility studies.
And so I am the director of the Neurogenic Bowel Program. I'm also a faculty at Atrium Health and I instruct fellows and residents and PA students. Um, and so the Neurogenic Bowel Program is relatively new. It started last year, um, we created it. And so a big part of this is I see patients with spina bifida, um, cerebral palsy, patients who have had gunshot wounds um, like to their spine, motorcycle accidents, the whole gamut. I see all of those patients. MS is a common um, patient population that I treat. And so these patients have not had a bowel movement in months to a year. And um, they're very, very complex. And I have a patient case actually at the end of this presentation that we can discuss um, just so you can see kind of what the um, type of patient population that I see is. And so I am also very involved in research, like I said. So I present nationally at these conferences, especially like American College of Gastroenterology or the American Neurogastroenterology Motility Society. And this is a few posters that I worked on with the fellows um, about muscular dystrophy that I actually diagnosed on an esophageal manometry. So it was pretty cool. It was um, a 20. Eight, I think it was male who came to us with trouble swallowing and we did his manometry and it basically showed that he had no esophageal peristalsis or movement in his esophagus. And then we ordered certain labs and we found out he actually has muscular dystrophy um, so he could get help with his other muscular and neurological side effects. So that was a really cool case. And this is just an example of an esophageal manometry. So I read these studies, whether it's for trouble swallowing, acid reflux, um, chest pain, globus sensation. So feeling like you have something in your throat all the time. Um, and so it gives us a lot of information. It's basically pressure patterns of the esophagus. So this upper part here is the upper esophageal sphincter. So this may be weak if someone has Parkinson's or muscular dystrophy or something that's affecting that upper esophageal sphincter. And then this big swallow, like hockey stick is what we call it. It looks like a hockey stick. That's the swallow of the esophagus. And then this lower part is the lower esophageal sphincter. This may be loose if you have acid reflux or if you have a hernia, um, something like that. So it gives us a lot of information. So now um, I just wanted to go through a case study. Um, and this is a 47 year old Caucasian female that I saw in um, about two years ago now, um, but we are still seeing her. She has a past medical history of undifferentiated connective tissue disease, unknown etiology of blindness, papillary thyroid cancer, sespus resection. She had a ruin y gastric bypass, fibromyalgia, depression, inflammatory arthritis, lumbar spine fusion, and severe constipation where she doesn't have a bowel movement for months. And she was referred to the neurogastroenterology and motility clinic for further evaluation. So this is the type of patient that we see with this complex history um, with multiple different etiologies or causes of her symptoms. And I know this is a lot, but I'll go through it pretty fast. Um, so at this time of the referral, she was having progressive worsening of her constipation that had been going on for years. She had incomplete bowel movements with these large size stools that were only um, twice a week, but she was never completely emptied ever. She just had small bits that were really hard and large. And bowel movements that were described as hard, painful, so much rectal pain. She was unable to classify the stool because she was blind. And she reported that she was pushing and straining abdominal pain. She had decreased sensation, so she couldn't feel when the poop was in her rectum. And she had no urge to have a bowel movement. We did a motility workup that included a colonoscopy where she had hemorrhoids. Um, her preparation. So whenever she was trying to get cleaned out with her colonoscopy, it was not good. So she still had a lot of poop in there. Um, we did a colonic transit study, which is where we give the patient a capsule and the capsule has little radiopaque markers in there, little circles that show up on an x-ray. And we give that capsule and then we get an x-ray six days later and we look and see where are these little markers. 
if they're all over the colon, then that typically means that the colon is not pushing the way that it should. And this is a diagnosis of slow transit constipation or colonic inertia is the other name for that. And she, of course, had markers all over her colon and none empty. We also did an anal rectal manometry that showed she had an abnormal pattern um, of rectal coordination. So she actually squeezes when she should be pushing. So if you think about a toothpaste bottle and you're trying to push the toothpaste through a toothpaste hole with the cap on it, it's not going to get out. And that's what was happening to her. She had lack of sensation. So in an anal rectal manometry, we blow up a balloon and we say, can you feel this now? How about now? And then we're able to measure the compliance of the rectum and also are you able to feel it with the sensation and urge to have a bowel movement and this is how we usually diagnose neurogenic bowel um, so this is all of her workup um, revealed that she had this condition called dysenergic defecation which is the toothpaste bottle that i was talking about and she also had slow transit constipation and this is thought to be due to all of her past medical history, but specifically a myogenic mean muscle cause and a neurological cause with a pelvic floor disorder. Um, probably a neurogenic cause because she had the rectal hyposensitivity or lack of sensation. Um, she had tried many over-the-counter medications and had failed all of them. They didn't work. We also gave her multiple prescription medications that actually work on serotonin in the gut and help with the push of the intestines and also drugs to help to bring water into the colon to help the movement of the colon and help with pain sensation. And none of them worked for her. She didn't get any output. Um, we also were unable to do physical therapy at that time because she's blind. So we can't really tell her which exercises to do because um, of the blindness. And due to her persistent constipation with failed standard medical therapy and her pelvic floor disorder, the next step was an anal irrigation system for neurogenic bowel. So this is what I specialize in. So in my neurogenic bowel clinic, I train patients with neurogenic bowel how to use this anal irrigation system. And so what this is, and I'll show you pictures of it, but it's a high powered enema system that has a catheter on the end and it's self lubricated and it has a balloon that you blow up inside the rectum and then you pump water into the colon to help these patients who have not pooped in months to help them flush out their colon. So it's a high powered system to flush them out. Um, and the novelty of this case is that the patient was blind. And so no one had ever treated a patient who was blind with this anal irrigation system. So I had to work with the company and think about what options we could have. And no one had any options. So I was kind of left on my own on this one, but we figured it out. Um, so the control unit for this pump, and I'll show you pictures of this. This is actually me and the patient, and this is in my neurogenic bowel clinic. Um, so on this little pump system, it has a side for the balloon, which is the blue part, and then white for water, for the water to come out, and then A for air, and S for stop. So before I put these letters on there, the pump system was not utilized in patients who are visually impaired. So it's completely flat. You can't tell which is which. So I had to come up with a way for this patient to be able to feel which way to turn the knob to know how to use the system. So I actually went to Michael's and found these little stick on letters and put them on there and then taught her how to use it. And it has glitter on the top so she could feel them. And so after using the anal irrigation system, she said, I have not felt this good in years. She had a full, complete bowel movement the day that we trained her, which was the first time in months that she had had a bowel movement that was complete. And by modifying the pump, she was able to feel how to turn the pump and how to use it, which significantly improved her quality of life. She used to be a marathon runner prior to her gastrointestinal motility disorder um, where 
she wasn't able to run because she was so full of stool. She had so much abdominal pain. And so now she's back running marathons and participating in daily activities, taking care of her daughter. Um, and so it was just amazing. And so this is my doggy again, who graduated from advanced puppy school. So I had to share that as well. Okay, so we know I'll switch it back. Okay, can everyone see me again? What questions do you guys have? Oh, I can't hear anything. Yeah, can you hear me now? Let's see. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I was just gonna let you guys know if you had any questions go ahead and drop them in the chat um really quick i'll start it off one of the co-founders actually of ispr she was going to try and join in but she can't be here right now she was really interested in kind of what made you decide and like what it was like going through um the dmsc program and like what kind of made you go down that route and exactly what all en entailed so yeah yeah so um i had originally chosen to go into the dmsc program specifically for my leadership role so i knew that i didn't just want to go straight to be a clinical pa i really wanted a leadership role in my program um and i also wanted to go into research so for those of you who aren't as familiar with research um it's very hard if you only have a master's degree to get put on certain grants or to ever be a PI of any study. Um, so pharmaceutical companies who will approach your hospital system will always go to your attending because they're a doctor. Um, and so I wanted to be able to run pharmaceutical studies and to be an active participant in research and apply for grants and things like that. So the DMSC program set me up to be able to do that. And so now I apply um, to be national speaker, to apply to national grants um, because of that doctor. And they usually will take that um, just like PhDs typically can do that. OK, awesome. I think there's a few questions as well. Um, so how is the work-life balance? Do you have time for yourself and what's your schedule like? So I have a very different schedule than a normal PA, um, who just does clinical. So I actually only see patients three days a week and each of my clinic spots is an hour long. And the most that I see on a day is eight patients. So I only have four slots in the morning, four slots in the afternoon. And the, you know, and that's because the patients are so complicated. So I have to have that much time with each of them. And then the other days I read motility studies like the esophageal manometries and the anal rectals. And then I also do research during that time or have meetings, things like that. I'm usually there and it depends sometimes seven o'clock and then I'll leave at seven at night. It just depends on how many studies I have. Do the surgeons need me for something? But then some days I don't get there until 11 o'clock and then I leave at three. It just honestly depends on the day. But I would say overall, my work-life balance is fantastic. Um, it's way better than inpatient for sure. And then let's see. If the patient has chronic constipation and cannot poop, where and how does it leave the body? That's actually a good question. And patients ask me that all the time. It actually sits inside of the colon where the poop is formed for however long it sits in there. So patients will actually, they can perforate their colon because the poop sits in there for so long because it hardens up so much. And then you can also get ulcers 
ulcerations in that colon because the poop has been sitting there for so long. So it never leaves. You just build more and more. And that's why patients are so uncomfortable. Um, would you recommend getting the doctorate? I would recommend getting the doctorate if you think that you're going to want a leadership role or if you think that you want to go into research. I would say if you're just going to be 100% clinical, it's never bad to have a doctorate, but I'm not sure that it would 100% help you with that realm. And then, okay, that's the same question about the poop. With your path to being a PA, were there any struggles along the way? If so, any advice to overcome those? Yeah, there are definitely a lot of struggles. So anytime that you choose to be a PA, which I never wanted to go to medical school. Um, I always wanted to be a PA ever since I was age 12. And that's one because the work-life balance. But also, I think that there is such a realm for PAs to grow. And you can be the first at something. There's never a first physician that really goes into a field, right? There's always a first PA that goes into a field and can grow it and become a director of something because you're the first one, which is pretty cool. Um, and the struggle is whenever you walk into a room, and I mean, I was a PA, I graduated whenever I was 22, 23. And so whenever I walk into the room, it's always like, well, when am I going to see the doctor or why, why is the nurse in here? You know, I get that all the time. And I have to be like, no, I'm the only one taking care of you. So that's a really big struggle. And then also research, pharmaceutical companies will reach out to me to talk to me just about the medication. And they'll only reach out to my um, physician talking about research studies. And they say, oh, PAs don't do research. That's not true. I always say, no, PAs can do anything that a physician can. And we collaborate on all of those things. Um, and what does your doctorate change that distinguishes you from a clinical PA? I think, again, yeah, just the, the leadership role. So it's just a stigmatism, honestly, that PAs, the name is physician assistant. I love that physician associate is coming out. I think that's great. Um, I, I think whenever people hear assistant, it just has more of a negative connotation. And so if you can say, I'm Dr. Jarvis, people automatically will just respect you, especially whenever it comes from research. Do you offer any research tips? Yeah, I would say do everything that you possibly can. So if you have any opportunities, I don't know who's in undergrad, who's in, you know, in your graduate degree, but especially in undergrad, if you have any opportunities or if you are living or going to school um, near a, you know, a university, then I would go to whoever the PhDs are and try and be involved in their research. Because if you already have publications going into school, into PA school or into medical school, whatever you want to do, that's going to be huge and look really great for you. What else? Anything else? Is there any way we would be able to reach you in the future if we have any questions about PA school? I'm interested in Lynchburg's DMSC program. Yeah, um, definitely. So you can either message me on um, Instagram. I try and answer those. Um, or you can send me an email um, and I can leave my email below. I can type it for everybody um, if you have any questions. Um, and I would definitely say just check out the program and they have really good videos on it. High school students, yes. Um, so like I said, I literally went door to door, which is harder now with COVID, I'll say, but and asked people if I could shadow them. And you'd be surprised what the healthcare field will let you do. Like they let me come into surgeries and see patients and basically do what you're doing on your shadowing experiences whenever you're in college. So for high school students, I would say 
try and do everything and volunteer. Um, really, graduate degrees really love for you to volunteer with anything that you do. So go and support your food banks, your churches, your whatever, your nutritional, um, like food fairs, things like that, that people really need your help. It'll be worth it in the long run. Hello. Hi. Um, I have a, a quick question and thank you for your um, presentation. I really enjoyed it. It's very interesting what you. you're doing. Um, but uh, one question I had is, um, you know, apart from the, I know you said about the work-life balance, what other aspect um, like kind of made you more to choose to be a um, PA rather than say um, a medical doctor? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, so I, especially the schooling, right, because it is less time. So that was definitely a factor. Um, this shouldn't ever be the reason, but it is a great reason is that student loans, of course, are a lot less in PA school. So um, think about, you know, you can always think about that in the long run. Um, and then I, I really chose to be a PA because I looked at also, if you look at healthcare law, right? PAs don't get sued nearly as much as physicians. So these are all great things. I used to take some call, but I only take call once a year. And like my attending is on call every other weekend. Um, so work-life balance is definitely um, aspect on that. And then I love being able to go to my collaborating physician and just talk things out. Um, especially with these complicated patients. So if you are a PA, you have more opportunity to work as a team dynamic. And I love being a PA because you're kind of like a manager. You manage the physician, you manage the nurses, you help with all the tests, and you kind of bring everyone together. You're kind of like a leader in that system, um, like a coach. I always say I'm the coach. I try and get everybody in to huddle because the physician's always doing their own thing and I'm always having to worry about everything. So it's, it's fun. <laughs> nice. What, what, what do you mean by worrying about everything? Like, or kind of like in a sense of like, just trying to get everyone together, like on the same page of like working together, like say on a case or something like that. Yeah. So PA's main role, um, at least in the U S healthcare is to, provide better access. So you, your goal is always to be there for patient questions, maybe whenever the physician's not. Um, I'm a really bad example of this because my clinic is already booked out to 2022, but you are supposed to be able to have better access. So maybe if I wasn't here, then she would be booked out to 2023. Like, you know, so you're supposed to be able to help um, in that way. And nurses, 10 nurses, CMAs, the techs, whoever, they tend to come to you as a PA for a lot of questions because maybe the physician's not there. Um, so you're kind of like the bridge in between everybody. Um, so it, it's great. You don't have all the responsibilities that maybe the physician has with call and procedures and those types of things, but you're able to help more um, facilitate questions and things like that with the nursing staff. Cool. Thank you. Um, uh -huh. and, oh, and I just had a quick follow up question of, um, and I know with PAs, you, you know, before you apply to PA school, you have to have, um, more like clinical experience or more definitely like more experience than say if you were going to apply to medical school um but like what kind of experience did you do like before get it like applying to pa school or or what like yeah clinical experience suggestions do you have yeah so i actually did my um the cna program so that's how i got all of my hours and i mostly worked in the psychiatric hospital 
uh, at Wake Forest. And so I did all of my patient hours as a CNA, which was really, really cool. And then the autopsy, I also did a lot of autopsies for patient experience as well. And so I think whenever I applied to PA school and I'm in an interview, being in a psychiatric hospital and working in autopsies, that kind of really sparked their interest going to PA school. So I think they wanted to talk to me more about that. And it really um, made them remember me. So that would be my bit of advice is if you're going to choose something, maybe try and find something that's really different and unique and innovative. And so you can really talk about it and have really insane, crazy experiences that the interviewer is never going to forget. Thank you. Yeah. Um, um, I hate to cut questions off because I absolutely love everybody's questions, but because we're nearing an hour, we kind of have to wrap it up, which sucks. But um, first of all, thank you so much, um, Dr. McKenzie. I absolutely loved hearing about all of this and I'm sure everybody did. It was super interesting. Um, and I'm going to send the link in the chat for the Google form. All you have to do is put your name in your email and kind of how you heard about ISPR. Um, and we're going to email the certificate to you. Um, for the certificates from last week, I need to check if they're emailed out. I'm not sure if that email got sent. Um, so those will both be out within a week. Um, if you guys missed something during this webinar, um, I am recording it right now and it will be uploaded to YouTube. So if you ever wanna go back and see or see any of our other speakers, you can totally do that. Um, and just thank you all so much for coming. Make sure you fill out that Google form cause I'll probably close it in about half an hour. Um, but yeah, again, thank you so much everybody for joining us tonight. And thank you so much, Dr. McKenzie. Thank you all, thanks. Good luck with everything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, here's the link again, if you guys missed that. If not, I'm going to end the call and thank you all so much for coming. Um, be sure to join our next webinar that starts in about five minutes.